Hello, I feel like it's been forever since I've even spoken about my PhD. And I've been reflecting a bit recently about now I finished my PhD, what have some of the skills been that I've taken from that PhD into my work now, which isn't in academia. And I think it's like a really useful thing to reflect on because there are some times where people are like, oh, you did a PhD, like, did you need to do that to be in the job you're in now? And I think it's massively helped me to get to where I am. Hi, I'm Julia and I currently work as a producer in science radio programs for the BBC and I make loads of really cool news programs and documentaries that are all about science. I can't believe I'm still saying this, it's actually like a dream job for me to do because it combines perfectly my love of science and my love of chatting and being creative. But before that, I did my PhD in neuroscience and I was at uni studying neuroscience for 10 years at UCL in London. And I went all the way through undergrad, did my master's in neuroscience and then did a four year PhD programme. I have a whole video about like how I got into my PhD programme here. And that was where I did one year where I did three different projects and I got to pick one of those projects to take on for the big PhD. And then I did that for three years and I was due to graduate in 2020. Yes, September 2020 was my end date. So as you can imagine with that situation, I did not finish in 2020 and I have a whole series about writing up my thesis as well <laughs> during a global pandemic, which was definitely a challenge. And I think for someone like me who very much likes to move around, get out and about when I'm doing work, which is quite intense, that I found it just really difficult being sat alone doing a thesis, but I've got a whole series on that. So yeah, I ended up finishing my degree. We all got given blanket. If you're in that cohort where you were meant to finish in 2020, everyone got six months of extra funding which actually I found to be so good because I got funded until what, March 2021? And that meant that I could really take my time with the thesis. I wasn't having to be like, oh my God, my deadline's like this soon, I've got to rush. I could just work, you know, do a good four or five hours every day and then take the rest of the day, take some time away from it and come back to it. So it actually ended up being in the end, initially it was very difficult, but it ended up being like a nicer process than I think if I was finishing it in September, 2020, it would have been like so much more of a rush than it was. My PhD research was in Alzheimer's disease, neurobiology. That's a subject that was really close to my heart. It was the whole reason that I studied neuroscience in the first place was because of my family history with Alzheimer's disease. And I think doing the PhD, in Alzheimer's disease for me really made it not feasible but it made it a lot better to endure because PhD is a hard slog and so doing it in an area that I was really personally connected to helped me to keep going when times got a bit rough got a bit tough but during the PhD I sort of realized that academic life wasn't for me at that point in my life. I mean, there might be a point in the future where I decide like, yeah, I want to do that. But while I was in the lab, I just felt like something was missing and I can't explain what that was, but my personality, I'm quite an extroverted, like being around a lot of people, like chatting and like being creative. And I feel like the creative side was actually quite fulfilled in doing lab work because you have this question and then you're like, okay, how do I answer it? And you have to try lots of different things. But there was just a part of me that I felt wasn't able to be fully expressed while I was in the lab. And during my PhD, I found science communication as a career, which is like, I'd never even heard of science communication as a job before. And the whole reason it came about was because my friends said to me, you know, whenever I go for dinner with them or a coffee, I chew their ear off about science. And they were like, Julia, you should just be doing this online because it's interesting and you obviously love doing it. So I started doing just that on Instagram, found a whole community of people 
who were doing the same thing and then realized there was this whole job of science communication and i did used to think you know you'd watch tv shows about science or i'd listen to radio shows or podcasts about science and go like who makes these shows because i want to do that and i just didn't even think like is, how do you get into that i thought you had to be like a journalist anyway cut a long story short i ended up going into a research communications role right after my phd at alzheimer's society and that's a big dementia research charity in the uk perfect job for me because i was already really in tune with the alzheimer's research and dementia research field in terms of the science so it meant i could really focus on getting my communication skills down translating the research into exciting stories and doing that for fundraising doing that for the media and it was just a great learning experience to hone the communication side of things and then from there i ended up getting a job in the media and i was presenting and producing a science radio show did that for a year and then moved over to the bbc and now yes i'm in my role as a content producer at the bbc for all the science stuff so yes okay that was my career history in a in a nutshell so if someone's doing a phd right now and academic life is not really something that you're wanting to do i don't think the phd is a waste and uh, for me i can really reflect now and see ah because i did my phd i really think that some of the skills i have now i would not have been able to get into my career without that phd so i thought i'd go through those skills now i picked five and there are probably more but these are the five that have really helped me in my career now in science communication science media but I think they're just transferable across every single job. The first thing is working independently. Doing a PhD, I was working by myself a lot of the time. And I think I'm really grateful to my supervisors for instilling this in me because my supervisors were brilliant and they gave me great direction, but they weren't micromanaging me at all during my PhD. And it would be very much like we'd have a meeting and it'd be like, okay, Julia, what do you think? you should do and I'd say you know I've got this idea I've got this idea I've got this idea and they go okay go away and do that and we'll meet again in three weeks and we'll see how it goes or my supervisor one of them sat like on the desk over from me so you know if something was really going wrong I could just sit with her and chat chat it through but they were great at letting me take the reins and letting me make the decisions and trying something out and if it didn't quite work then I could you know go away and and try something different so it really taught me how to like make my own choices how to make things happen you know with research there are often many problems that need to be solved and it was the case that I could think about okay how can I make this thing happen I set up a whole new area of technique in my lab department never been set up there before and I was the one who you know wanted to make that happen and so I did so I got people in to help train us up I got all the facilities you know sorted out and I got all the like supplements in that we needed all of the equipment I arranged all of that so it really was okay I want to make this happen how do I make it happen and that came from that independent work ethic as well so I think that really transfers across into my role now as a producer because I have to do a lot of independent work it's actually quite similar I think to the PhD in the respect of it's like okay here's the program that you're working on or here's the package you've got to make off you go and so you've got to you know research it yourself find the people you want to interview reach out to them and not be afraid to reach out and like be like oh I don't know what to say like just be quite fearless in that respect you know email or pick up the phone and just call someone I've got to make things happen a lot of the time by myself and there is this deadline and it is very much the case of like okay if it's done by the deadline that's completely fine I feel like the PhD was very like that as well it's like we don't really mind how you do it obviously within reason like not unethical or not like completely like slacking off and whatever but you get it done to a really high standard in whichever way suits you best and from the PhD that is something that I had to do constantly all the time so yeah I think as a producer that independent work ethic that I got from the PhD 
I didn't have that in my undergrad at all, really. Obviously, you had to revise for stuff, but I think the PhD is a whole different ball game when it's like, there's no one really forcing you to do this stuff, you know? Like, if you don't want to do it, you just won't get the degree. So just, yeah, you've got to have that inner independent drive and I definitely have to use that every single day now. The next thing is planning long term and that again is like when you have a deadline working backwards from that deadline to make sure that you're going to hit it. In my PhD I would do this for myself because the only deadline you really have is your submission date. You know there are other deadlines if you're doing grants or you know if you've got paper due in or if you've got a certain application that you want to do then there's a, a deadline given to you but other than that the deadline is you've got to submit by September 2024 or something like that and while that's good to have you know all of this time in between I find that if I don't have structure it's very easy for me to get completely overwhelmed so during my PhD what I would do is every three months I'd make a Gantt chart got a whole video on how I made Gantt charts and in essence a Gantt chart is a timetable or a schedule where you can see the amount of time a task is going to take so what I would do is I'd go okay three months time what do I want to achieve in three months time and I'd make a note of the things that I wanted to achieve and then I'd order them so I'd be like okay what is the priority really for the three months so you go that and that and that okay fine then we go to the Gantt chart, I'd be like, okay, so of this priority, what are the steps that I need to do to make that happen? So I break it down into the, all the little steps that I need to get that end result. I want to know by the end of this month, I want to have this assay ticked off the list. Okay, what are all the steps that are going to lead me to that result? So you break it down, I break it all down. And then next to each of those things, I'd write down how long each activity should take me. Sometimes an activity might be like, okay, that's going to take me three days to do. Other times it could be, right, that's going to take me two months to do. I was working with cells that took ages to grow. So sometimes it would take a few months. And then what I do is put it all into my Gantt chart, working back from the three month point. So I'm like, okay, this is the end result. And then I'd put in all of the steps before and you could see exactly how long they were going to take and so that meant that each week I would come in I'd open up my computer and I could see on the Gantt chart exactly what I was meant to be doing that week and I didn't really think too much about the end result I would be like okay that's my aim for the week get that done and if I didn't get it done I could just shimmy things along on the Gantt chart because it wasn't you know three months and that's it that's the deadline it, obviously if it went over it went over it didn't really matter because I had like two years or whatever till I had to hand it in so it was just a way for me to really structure my time when I didn't have that much structure in there and so then with my job now this is something that I have to again do but on much shorter time scales so there is a bit more of a pressure in terms of like you know you've got a radio show that's going out on this day at this time you know <laughs> that's a very hard deadline because it has to be in and it has to be out on the radio at that exact time you can't be like oh can I push it back a week no it has to be done so the deadline is a little bit stricter but again it's this working backwards and breaking things down so I'll go okay the end result is on this day I want to have this whole show done okay so what are the steps for me to get that show done break it all down and then give everything a time frame it's like okay well I need to research the program that's going to take me about a week to go through the papers and go through what's out there and then I need to reach out to people then I need to put calls in and you can sort of start to slot everything into place and it gives you that run up to the actual deadline and I think doing the PhD because I had that so nailed down during the PhD it's been almost natural for me to just do that for my projects now I don't even have to think about it I, I naturally now just break things down put a time frame on it put it all into my diary and then each week I'm like just focus on that thing focus on that focus on that and then you end up like oh it's done with hard work obviously but it just takes out all the drama of like, I'm overwhelmed and I don't know what to do. Like the Gantt chart, massively helped. Next, I think the PhD really helped me with speaking, getting my point across, because in my PhD, I used to have to give talks once every three months on my data. <laughs> that again, gave me like impetus to like work, because it was like, if I'm getting up and I've done nothing in three months, then that's not great. So 
it, it was good for that. But also I had to just get up and be used to speaking in front of a crowd of, you know, 70 people, all who knew a lot about my field and then answer questions from these people as well. So I think that, having that every three months, the first few talks I did were pretty crap, I would say. You know, I was so nervous and I couldn't quite be myself. And I was like, oh my God, I need to get on all the data. But it really trained me to be like, okay, what are the most important points on this slide? Um, how do I get that across? What are the points I need to hit? And then we move on. And I got to this method of never have more slides than minutes you have to talk. So I would always aim to have less slides than minutes. So a 20 minute talk, I'd want no more than like 18 slides. And with those slides, I'd have like just diagrams normally and then a prompt sentence. And my dad always taught me, people in the audience don't want you to just read the slides out. They want you to talk and use that as like a springboard. So over time, I really honed being able to go, okay, what is the main message that I'm trying to get across with this one slide and how can I do it in one minute? And that has helped so much with working in radio and presenting because you only have, you know, normally like less than half an hour to do an entire documentary on a program or five minutes to explain an area of research that someone's put like their whole life into. And so it's really helped me to go, what are the important points that the audience need to know to get the whole gist and not leave anything out that's important and not miss out anything that's accurate so you want to still be accurate but punchy and you can move things along quite quickly so yeah my presentations in my phd helped me do that with science and now because i work in science radio that's been yeah that's just been something that i i take for granted now because i can sort of just do it but it was all that training in my phd that allowed me to do it now next i'd say critical analysis is something that the phd definitely gave me because again, I used to have all these like <laughs> meetings where people would question what you do. It was never in a way that was like nasty. It was more just like, oh, have you thought of that? Have you thought of that? Makes you think of lots of different things and doing my Viva process, especially, you know, having two examiners be like, why did you do something that way? And it really makes you question your own thought process and think, can I do this in another way that is more optimal? Or can I look for another angle on this? that is gonna give me, you know, a more fuller picture of like the field and the research that's going on. And it also helps obviously when you're reading a scientific paper to be able to distill it and be like, this is what this means. This is how strong the evidence is. These are the limitations of the evidence. And working in science media now, all that nuance is really important to get across when you're communicating a message about science because a lot of science is never 100%. Like you've always got some give because just because of how experiments are designed, you know, there's always gonna be a slight limitation on that. And I think having that element of, you know, what more needs to be done and also how could these methods potentially limit the results that we're trying to talk about. That is vital when you communicate in science. So the critical analysis side of things from the PhD has been something that I actually use all the time now. And on the other side of that as well, I think this sort of well-rounded approach of with the PhD, you often have a question and you don't have the answer and you don't really have a way to get to the answer. You have to think of the way to get to the answer. And that is creativity. That is so creative because you go, okay, this is what I wanna, this is what I wanna find out. How can I get there? and you apply all the different methods and you go, hang on, no, that didn't quite work. This might work. Oh yeah, actually, if I refine this a tiny bit, all of that is flexing that creativity muscle of thinking outside the box and pivoting and, you know, being like, oh, actually, if I just combine that with that, that could work. And again, in my job in radio, especially, you're wanting to craft a creative experience you're wanting to say, okay, how can I communicate this thing, which is really complicated to a listener who may never have heard of this thing before? What sound can I use? What analogy can I use to get this across in a really fun and rememberable way? And yeah, doing that throughout my PhD of having to constantly come up with new ideas, that now has made me quite 
open to just being at the drawing board and not really knowing where I'm going to go with something and just testing things out, trial and error, trial and error, until you find something that fits rather than being like, this is the one way to do it and the only way to do it and I've got to do it that way or it's not good. I think it really pushes the bounds of what I can do creatively because I had to do it for years and years in the lab with different experiments as well. And finally, I would say that one of the biggest skills, maybe even the biggest that the PhD taught me and that I take away now into my job is how to handle failure. Because in my PhD, I don't even wanna know how many times things <laughs> didn't work and you're constantly having to go back to the drawing board and go, right, that didn't work. Oh, why didn't that work? And it taught me to not take failure as personally, I'd say, because prior to the PhD, any failure I had, I took it as I was the problem. And so then the PhD, I was just faced with challenge after challenge after challenge after challenge, bombarded with failure. And initially I found it very hard because I was like, no, I should just get this right. But I learned doing the PhD that there are so many things that are out of my control and sometimes it's the tiniest little thing that is the line between something working and something not working and just tweaking that one tiny thing can be like oh now that actually works and taking that attitude outside of the lab it means that you know everything that i try and do now if it doesn't go my way i just see it as that's one option like try it again try and tweak one tiny thing try and work on that to make it a little bit more refined a little bit better and it yeah you just don't see failure as like a oh my god i'm the worst person oh my god that's a door closed it's more of a like okay let's go try it again i just don't take it as personally and i think in a job like media where there isn't a set path there isn't this okay i now need to do this now i need to do this it's just a lot of throwing stuff at the wall and seeing what sticks i think you know Oh, I'll try myself out for that. Oh, I didn't get that. Okay, move on to the next. And I'm not saying I'm perfect. There is definitely moments, especially because I think presenting, especially, you do take it personally because your person is doing the job. But at the same time, you can see like, oh, maybe it just wasn't the right time for me. Maybe they're looking for someone else. Maybe they have an idea in their head of who they already want. And you take lessons from it and you go away and you go, oh, you know, what could I work on? What is it the thing that maybe that time didn't go quite right? Is it something I can do? Was it just a bit out of my control? And you know, it's just, that wasn't right. I think it just, yeah. The PhD definitely changed how I see failure, my relationship with it now, which in the media industry is something that again, I'm coming up against over and over. And because I've already been in the training arena, I'd say with the PhD, I can now put myself into those positions more because I'm not so afraid of falling flat on my face. <laughs> right, well, that's the end of me chatting today. Hope you found it useful. If you're doing a degree right now or you're in a job right now that you think, oh God, this is not really what I wanna do, then there's always skills and there's always lessons to take away from that that you can apply elsewhere. And by reflecting in that way, I think that always is like, yeah, it's always just a nice thing to do. Uh, if you have a goal or you want to make a change in your life as well, I do have a book out. My new book is out called Braintenance. You can buy it now. And that is like essentially how to take any goal that you have, break it down, understand how the brain works and how to get your brain on your side. Because <laughs> that's always a big plus and yeah how to really build up the skills you need and embrace failure and embrace resistance too so yeah you can get that now put the link in the bio and if you like videos about brain psychology why we do some of the strange things that we do then subscribe to the channel and i will catch you in the next one bye